Hello, everyone. My name is Jules Urbach. I am the founder of a company called Otoy. Uh, some of you may know us uh, from some of the software that we create. Uh, Octane Render is uh, one of the earliest GPU renders. We've had a Blender integration for, God, I think over 10 years now. And we're also known for LightSage, which is a digital double scanning service, and the Render Network more recently, which is a distributed GPU cloud service that runs on uh, individual users' machines. And uh, when Tom asked me to come speak, I was pretty excited. We've been, um, really, we're focused on similar goals. We want to democratize content creation. In particular, uh, Otoy's focus has been on democratizing holographic spatial uh, tools and, and rendering. And, uh, and that's something that I think leads pretty nicely into the talk that I want to give today, which is called Towards the Star Trek Holodeck. Um, show of hands, how many of you are Star Trek fans? Wow, that's, that's a great amount. Good. So uh, you love Blender, you love Star Trek. This talk is for you. Um, the Star Trek holodeck, for those that may not be familiar, was a, uh, a room on the Starship Enterprise. It was uh, introduced in 1987 uh, in the pilot episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. And it was also featured, interestingly enough, in the very last episode, almost 20 years later, of Star Trek Enterprise. And while the holodeck was a room that you could experience almost any virtual reality simulation in, it also had an interesting concept in the story of Star Trek, because it turns out that the show you'd just been watching, at least the last few years, may have all been on the holodeck. Uh, Will Riker uh, you know, is looking at the history of that show, and he's on a future enterprise. And so the idea that, that sort of was stuck in fans' heads was, well, is the show that we're watching, is Star Trek actually just playing out in a simulation on a further enterprise in the future. Is it enterprises all the way down? And it's one of those mind twisters that's been an interesting part of both Star Trek and even our literal lives today when people talk about the simulation theory. Are we living in a simulation? Is the universe run uh, in a simulation? Uh, the most recent episode of Star Trek, believe it or not, was called Holograms All the Way Down. It was released just a few weeks ago, uh, touching on this theme. And at Otoy, you know, we've been working on projects related to Star Trek, which I'll be showing. But you can see here some of our work um, on the, uh, I guess, on the left, you'll see, or on the right, you'll see, um, uh, you know, the show. And on the other side, you'll see our render. And they're pretty close. And in fact, it makes you question. I mean, these were, of course, shows that were filmed before CG was, was this good. You know, is what you're seeing real or rendered, right? We have this... Um, same issue with AI, where we're not sure whether something we're seeing was created by a human or created by a machine, and it kind of goes beyond rendering. But I want to focus, as an aside, on the technology that might make something like the holodeck possible. Um, it looks like it's closer than the 200 or so years that it was set in the uh, Star Trek timeline. There's a company called Lightfield Lab that we partnered with that's actually building the real-life Star Trek holodeck. They were inspired just like me um, to go and see if that's something that could be created. And they're working on the display technology. It's a couple of years out. It's going to be in location-based entertainment uh, first, theme parks, things like that. But like, you know, giant 4K TVs uh, that were $150,000 uh, and are now hundreds of dollars, this will go down in cost significantly. And the beauty of these uh, holographic panels is that you'll be able to have all these incredible experiences without wearing any VR glasses. We've been building... Uh, tools to create content for those things. And we're using, here we're using an iPad, we have projectors with tracking. Um, but if you actually go see the display up north uh, in uh, uh, Northern California at their labs, it's incredible. I mean, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, again, hopefully the public will be able to see it at large. But these panels are tileable. It's like the Samsung video wall. So the larger the surface area, the more tiles you make, the larger the hologram can push in and out. And if you have, I don't know, something like $15 million, you can put this on the ceiling, curve it around, you can actually build the holodeck. It's expensive, but it can be done. And uh, it's hard to capture how good this looks on a 2D video, but here it is. This is basically the holographic panel. As you move your eyes, if you focus on it, it looks real. It's very different than just stereo or auto stereo. It's truly sort of this magical endpoint, and it's very expensive to render on. I mean, these panels are something like um, 100K pixels by 100,000 pixels per meter. So it's an insane resolution. 
and it's challenging to create content that will render on those devices and also run in real time. Um, but we're working on that. Uh, going back to Star Trek and our work uh, related to that, uh, I was actually thrilled to find out that our render and our software was used to re-render my favorite movie, the Star Trek motion picture from 79. Uh, not only that, it was also rendered on the render network. It was actually those frames that were put in this remastered version that went out in theaters and on uh, Blu-ray uh, in 21. It was done on average users' machines, which is pretty cool. Uh, a couple of years after that, we did another project. This was featured in the Apple keynote um, twice, actually. And I'll be talking about this project a lot more later in the talk. But I want to show you a video uh, that was all done by us um, in 2022, and uh, I'll play it now. So that was pretty cool. The, uh, thank you. Now, I am very pleased to say that this wouldn't exist without Blender. In fact, a huge number of the artists working on this project use Blender and have been using it for a while. Um, I actually have a bunch of um, screenshots that they prepared for the, the Blender conference. We're all pretty excited to sort of show how Blender is being used in full productions, and it's being used to great effect. Uh, there's about, uh, I don't know how many years of, of assets we've been building for this project, uh, and Blender's been really instrumental and essential in making this happen. Uh, a lot of uh, our artists, actually, a lot of Star Trek used to be done in a tool called Lightwave, and that fell out of favor, and Blender really took over for a lot of these artists, and we've brought a lot of them onto the team. And it's not just Star Trek, we're actually doing other properties and IP as well in Blender, and it looks fantastic. Um, it's kind of incredible to see the trajectory that Blender's taken and you know, kind of grow with that as well. Uh, we've been building a lot of tools and technology around Blender. Obviously, we have Octane as a render in there. Cycles is fantastic. We love all renders. Um, but there are things that we've been trying to figure out. Like, how do you plug Blender into other pipelines, other tools? We do have other artists and other uh, assets in the, in the production pipeline, C4D, Unreal Engine. And so we've been building tools, for example, like this one, that take everything that's happening in Blender as a scene graph and run that into another process. You can have live linking. It's super fast. Uh, we can take something and bring it into Unreal Engine, share those materials, share that same pipeline. Obviously, as we look towards standards like USD, Material X, that's being adopted in Blender, um, those might help. But in the meantime, we've been developing these tools and this um, set of um, uh, pipelines really to allow us to go from modeling in Blender, rendering in Octane, doing virtual production on an air wall in Unreal Engine. And you know, it's something that has is, is definitely been very helpful to us. Uh, but we've also been looking towards the future as well. I mean, there are standards that are emerging that are going to be great for making this um, you know, pretty much a commodity. And I think that uh, the Hydro Render Delegate system is one such uh, piece. It's being uh, released, obviously, in, in uh, Blender 4, which is amazing. We have a render delegate ready to go. And even within Octane, we have the ability to load other render delegates. And we've been playing with that, for example, being able to take two render delegates, Storm and Octane, or Cycles and Octane, and just do a shader and composite those together. Uh, obviously, you know, Blender has a great GPU compositor. There's a lot of really cool things you can do with technology like that. Uh, open standards are really important, not just for 
materials and meshes and data and APIs, but also just for collecting the works of artists themselves. How do you organize these things? And I think that's becoming especially important um, when you look at, at a lot of the major players that are trying to build, call it the metaverse or spatial computing. I think you know, a lot of people don't necessarily want one company or one format to control something as important as the spatial web. Um, and so I, I'm a strong believer in having open standards, open systems for this. Uh, you know, we've joined a number of organizations, including the Metaverse Standards Forum, Group Kronos, um, even going back as far as uh, I, I started with MPEG back in 2017 to try to foster open standards that would make sure that there's no piece of the asset pipeline that isn't open sourced and available because, you know, bit rot and these things are really a problem. And in fact, they, they get in the way of, of some of the pipeline issues that um, we we're trying to solve. Uh, we have, in, in fact, created a couple of open source standards. Uh, one of them is called ITMF that extend things like USD and Material X with the last missing pieces that we need to be able to do something like this, which is to send data between Blender and 26 other DCC tools, um, render them on the cloud without having to worry about the DCC being there. All those things become really important at scale, especially on the render network, which is built on running pretty much in the background on people's machines. We wouldn't be able to have a million GPUs in the cloud without having that capability. So it's not like running it on AWS or a data center. Um, the, the power and the speed and the cost reductions you get from having a decentralized GPU network matter, and it does help to not have to pull in 30 DCC tools into a render job. Uh, but of course, in the case of Blender, it's open source. We can integrate the Blender pipeline you know, into the mix, and that's been a really strong uh, positive point for, for our artists and our developers. Um, the work that we're trying to, to do to organize uh, individual artists and IP and all these things, and if you looked at the last talk, I think the idea of being able to have provenance over your artwork, your creations, whether you're coming from the digital world or the physical world, is incredibly important. Uh, Beeple, who is a well-known artist, uh, digital and physical, um, has been a friend of mine, and we've been taking his thousands of pieces of artwork and putting them into a system that he can basically have provenance over. Not an NFT, but something that just says, I rendered this, I created this, I sent it on the render network, every asset, every texture is hashed, and I can prove it was mine. And I can prove that if somebody runs a AI you know, learning job on it, this data, this came from this render. Uh, in the case of Alex Ross, another wonderful artist, a very good friend of mine, he is purely a, you know, a gouache painter. He uses watercolors, doesn't do any digital work. But we've been taking his paintings, which are beautiful. Uh, he's been probably best known for doing you know, tons of Marvel and DC work over the years. And we've been turning those into 3D uh, assets uh, that have been going into a similar archive. And you know, he's actually pretty interested in sort of seeing that digital world being created around his physical pieces. Uh, and in fact, the amount of, of work that he's done is so expansive, it really does seem to cover almost most of pop culture from the you know, late 20th and 21st centuries that we're in now. And if you look sort of at this pastiche, you almost see you know, the, uh, you know, the seeds of what could be you know, the metaverse, like you know, something that, that comes out of Snow Crash uh, or Neil Stevenson's book or Ready Player One. And in fact, Neil Stevenson, who I've had the pleasure of, of getting to know recently, um, is also pretty intent on having a very open standards-based metaverse. Um, going back to Beeple's work for a minute, um, you know, again, a lot of his forward-looking work is really going back to physical pieces, even though he's a, you know, m most well-known for being a digital artist. And so some of his newer pieces are really cool. I mean, they are physical pieces. You install them in a museum or you buy them in, in, in this form. And they're pre-rendered, and they're on LEDs that are you know, meant to fool you into thinking you're looking into the piece. But obviously, with the holographic display panels from LFL that are coming out in a couple of years, um, you'll be able to have a piece from him that looks like it's been physically created, but it'll be digital, it'll be rendered. And this is the kind of stuff that I find fascinating um, as the future of these technologies all converge in these really interesting ways. Um, the third archive project that I want to talk about, and it's the one I'll be spending the rest of this talk discussing, is the Gene Roddenberry Archive. This one has enormous personal interest to me. My, my best friend's dad was Gene Roddenberry. He, uh, Rod Roddenberry, his son, invested in, um, uh, in Otoy and uh, created an endowment that started this project. And initially, the Roddenberry Archive was really just you know, scanning in documents, scanning the millions of pages that Gene Roddenberry had wrote 
um, you know, obviously he's best known for creating Star Trek, but there are many other sci-fi stories and things that he had, um, you know, put out there over the years. Uh, and the archive work that we had done since 2021 has focused on not just the written word, but also the visual aspect of Star Trek, right? Basically taking everything, because it's a visual medium, right? It's not just the, uh, the, the printed page. You know, how do you preserve the work of, of all the people that created the sets, the designs um, for this show? And we're fortunate enough to have a lot of those people still around. Uh, Mike and Dean Sakuda, who wrote the Star Trek Encyclopedia, and who curated the 11-foot uh, Enterprise model that's in the Smithsonian, all of that is part of this archive. And it's more than just you know, scanning in you know, data and, and models. It's also figuring out how all these pieces connect to tell the story of Star Trek, uh, both in the fictional universe of Star Trek, but also in the production of its creation. So you can see in that video I just played, you can see the actual you know, piece of, uh, of, of, of the show, and you can then flip into the uh, stage nine where it was filmed, or the lot in Paramount, or Desilu. Um, one of the other aspects, though, on the flip side of that is you want to have the 1,000-foot version of the Enterprise, not the 8-foot model or the 11-foot model that was filmed. And that was one of the very first pieces that we took on in this project. It's sort of been a dream of many people even before me to see you know, that Enterprise made life-size. This is some um, yeah, renders from a proposed 90s Vegas uh, hotel that was going to be a life-size Enterprise. But this is our version of it. Um, we're about 30% of the way through it. You can see the inside of the ship. Every room is, is detailed. You see Kirk's coffee mug. It's all there, uh, and it's beautiful. And we're also working on the world around Star Trek. Right? It's not just the ship. It's what's outside of it, Earth, the solar system, the galaxy as, it, as it's been you know, defined in that show. Um, and if you're a fan of Star Trek, um, this is pretty cool. I mean, it really is something where this data, this exists in a form, with, regardless of how it's rendered and what the medium is, that allows you to sort of see the show and the world in a way that I think is pretty novel and unique. And it's something that's really been driven out of passion and love. Um, but it's also gotten a lot of attention since we started putting out these renders and these pieces. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone as far as to you create the entire solar system as quiescently as we can, the Starship Enterprise, and even the leather and the, uh, you know, the 70s shag carpet that was in the recreation deck in 79, all of that's there. And when you take these renders and you put them up next to the actual, you know, footage or film, it looks pretty good. You can also create interactive experiences with it where you can go inside of the Enterprise and you can look at the buttons, you know, push the levers, all of it. So it's not just a static scene. That's an important aspect also of, of trying to preserve how these sets and how that world worked. Um, and, and while we have the folks that can help us basically create the provenance for this, we're trying to build all of it. Uh, and it's a pretty exciting project. Again, sort of my favorite Star Trek movie is the 79 film, so this is that bridge where you go inside of it. Audio's there, every panel is working. Uh, this is the in-universe version. So this is, you know, there's no plywood, there's no cameras, there's no set lights. This is what it would look like if you're you know, on the ship operating it as, as a crew member. Uh, and, you know, there's more than just, of course, this first movie. There's, yeah, you know, 12 movies that followed it. So Star Trek II, uh, Star Trek III. We've built all of those versions of the Enterprise. And, again, we've done our best to make sure that it's, you know, exactly like it was in the film um, and in the production. Uh, in the case of the movie Enterprise, we do happen to have the blueprints for the whole ship. It's one of the only versions of the Enterprise in those six movies that has that. There's a lot of other Enterprises. We're building 3D models of all the concept versions that were created before they went into production. And then you have the timeline of this ship. It's like 40 years from 2245 when it was launched to 2285 when it blew up in Star Trek III. And if you look at all these versions, you play them back, it's almost like a time lapse of history. And these are all the uh, you know, renders of the, uh, of the ship sort of overlaid on each other through time. It's, pretty cool. And so the experience you can have is almost going through time and going through space um, to see the world of Star Trek and the story itself play out. Uh, as it turns out, there's not just one Enterprise, there's many ships that preceded it and followed it. Uh, the more, most famous one, of course, is from the TV show, but there's about 13 or 14 others. Uh, one of the more famous ones is from the 90s. It's from uh, you know, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, Enterprise D, Captain Picard ship. And again, you know, we've done our best to make it absolutely perfect. There's a follow-up ship, the uh, Enterprise E from the uh, uh, 96 movies. And uh, again, the, uh, you know, the detail is pretty exquisite. So 
you know, there's another aspect to this, which is if you build the sets of this quality, sure, you can give people an experience that allows them to go in there and explore that and have it saved to posterity, but you can also film in those sets in virtual production as well. And we've gone to the trouble of, I mean, even Picard's fish from his uh, office is in this, in this world, recreated perfectly. Um, but there's a lot more to this than just these fun pieces. There's also documenting um, you know, the people that, are, you know, that, that worked on the show that also acted in the show. So we had William Shatner come in. He sat in the 1979 Starship Enterprise, the one I just showed you, in a you know, virtual production facility in an air wall, and he loved it. He was super excited. And, you know, his interview was just amazing. I and mean, he talked about, you know, how he wanted Kirk's story to end and how it didn't go that way. And so we have all this amazing, you know, these interviews, uh, this behind-the-scenes footage, and, of course, you know, a lot of uh, beautiful renders that cover, effectively, 60 years of Star Trek history, 800 hours of the show, everything from the J.J. Abrams movies to the, um, you know, to the original 1964 pilot that wasn't aired. Uh, back in April, we put out an uh, interactive experience on the web. It was uh, online for three weeks, just an experiment, and people loved it. It got a lot of attention. The Smithsonian, of all places, actually wrote an article about it. Uh, this was the uh, you know, early interface that we had for the web portal, but you can see there's a timeline. You can look at all the different ships. Um, the Akutas, who wrote the Star Trek Encyclopedia, helped us create the text and the uh, information that's there. Uh, Major Roddenberry, uh, my friend's mother, who was the voice of the Starship Enterprise, you know, she recorded all of her venoms, all of her dialogue um, right before she passed so that one day we could bring her voice back. And 15 years later, we did. And so that's part of the experience as well. And there's about 20 other alternate timelines and things like that that are actually also created for this experience. It's pretty amazing. Um, back in April, we also put out another video. It was, again, a concept video, no dialogue, um, just meant to serve as an interstitial after William Shatner's interview. And it was unlisted on YouTube. It got a million something views, and people really loved it. They went crazy, and it got much more attention than we ever expected. Um, I'm going to play that one next. It's about two minutes. Um, here it goes. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Um, how am I doing on time? I want to make sure I, uh, I don't go over here. Um, it, just briefly, I, I know that we're, we are running short. Um, you know, the, the work that we're doing also involves scanning, you know, actual assets, including the uh, set from the Star Trek Picard season three, the Enterprise D, that was me on set. Uh, our team scanned it in, preserving it. Our team's also built these props and these assets. 
Um, it's, it's an amazing project. You can go see this on otoy.com, on the blog. Uh, we're hoping to have a lot more put out there in the uh, months to come. I do want to show a couple of the uh, behind the scenes of Star Trek The Cage, the very first pilot episode. We brought in the director. Uh, it was amazing to have him on set and to show you know, basically the world of 1964 brought to life in this you know, really quiescent way. Uh, and I think on the, uh, I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to um, the end of the presentation here. You can see how we created Spock. It was done with, an, you know, basically, this is the actor Lawrence Selleck who played Spock. Literally, there's no digital work on him that you're seeing here. He looks so much like Leonard Nimoy um, with just prosthetics that it was an incredible, uh, incredible match. And we did use um, some digital techniques on his face, which you can see here live as we're filming it to get, uh, to get him to look that, you know, to get him to look almost perfectly like Nimoy. We also would scan the actors in um, with a 40 capture system where we could relight them later, uh, which was pretty useful. And we experimented with nerves, green screen, CG. Turns out that CG scans and being able to sort of bring uh, the actors in costume uh, through a, uh, a rendering process looked to be the most, uh, you know, to be the highest fidelity. Uh, and as we've, you know, explored virtual production even further, you know, we've done a lot of physical props that we've scanned in. We've had to de-age and age uh, Lawrence, who's our actor playing Spock on set. Um, and it was very challenging to do that last scene because, again, he's transitioning from an older Spock to a younger Spock. This is the uh, virtual capture system that we were using. This is me helping the director set that shot up. And as you look at these beautiful renders, you know, where this is all heading before you get to the holodeck is a pair of really beautiful uh, mixed reality glasses, which are being put up by Apple next year. And that's something that I want to end this talk on, which is showing our roadmap for the Vision Pro. Um, it's definitely challenging. We're doing renders at 16K by 16K or uh, 48K um, in the case of stereo cubic panoramas. And that's just for a simple panorama. For something that you need to actually move through or walk into, you have to render a light field. Uh, which is a, a, a volumetric rendered job that is um, part of our pipeline. And you can see here it's running in the uh, simulator. It actually will allow you to explore these worlds at final render quality on the Apple headset. And that's pretty remarkable. We've been trying to work towards this technology for a while, and it's finally here. And on the playback side, we, we explored we, you know, WebXR, which does work on the Vision Pro. HTML5 is a model element. But we are building a native uh, viewer for the light fields, among other things. And uh, you know, we're hoping to have that out sometime uh, next year when the device launches. Uh, and you can see in mixed reality, I mean, the quality of, of some of these assets that you couldn't really appreciate on the web page is awesome. I mean, you can see here this Enterprise J, the you know, Enterprise hundreds of years in the future, has a whole world, the whole city inside of it. And in mixed reality, when you, look, you take a close look at that asset, you can see all that. It's actually incredible. It makes you really reimagine how you know, content can be consumed when you have this kind of uh, fidelity and quality. And so we see the future of rendering and content creation as being pretty awesome and um, really exciting. So thank you all. Uh, it's been a pleasure presenting this today and uh, look forward to talking to some of you uh, after, uh, after I wrap up here. Thank you all.